You're back from the thermo exam. We missed you on Thursday. Right. All right. So um, re recall the schedule. We have um, class this week. Next week is spring break, right? Okay. And then the week after that, there's only class on Tuesday because I'm traveling. So after this week, there'll be one class in two weeks. And so you have a homework due tomorrow. And then there's not a homework due for like three weeks or something like that. All right. Okay. I guess there's a help session tonight. Is that? Or was it last night? It's tonight. All right. Okay. So um, we continue to... Um, Discuss this equi ah, problem here. Okay, a x equals b, and so this particular lecture is focused on a particular problem that often occurs when you try to solve these problems, especially when you try to solve them numerically, um, which has to do something called ill conditioning of the matrix A. So, before I do that, I have to introduce some machinery, some of which you've seen, but probably not most of it: vector and matrix norms. I'm pretty sure you've seen at least a, a vector norm, which I'll convince you of. I don't have my pointer again. It's no battery, so that's why I'm up here. Um, second of all, I'll introduce the idea of what I mean by ill-conditioned matrix and the implications thereof. And then I'm going to discuss how you measure whether a matrix is ill-conditioned in a, using something called the condition number. And then I'll go through, I think, four different examples of, of matrices that either are or are not ill-conditioned to give you some idea of what the implications of ill-conditioning are. Oops. Okay. So I probably should have split this slide up on a two, but I didn't, so we'll go through it slowly. Um, nothing here is very exciting or new, I don't think, probably. So what we're talking about here is um, a norm of a vector. And so the idea is if I give you a vector and ask you a question of like how big the vector is, um, usually when people talk about something like that, they want some kind of scalar measure of something, okay? So what a norm does is it takes a vector and it produces a scalar from it, and the scalar is some measure of how big the vector is, okay? Um, the notation we use is, the, is this right here. Okay. So that means norm of the vector x. And sometimes you'll see a number down here, which I'll talk about, and that's because there's different kind of norms. And so if I want to be specific about what norm I'm talking about, I'll put a number here that I'm about to explain to you. Okay, so I bet you've seen the, the, see the thing that says 2 norm? Also, it's known as Euclidean norm. Um, and the idea there is if I, so here we have a vector. So I'm giving you a vector here, and it looks like x1, x2, down to xn. Okay, so n-dimensional vector, column or row makes no difference. And so the two norm is defined as shown here. Okay, usually called the two norm, I call it the Euclidean norm. So you take each element of the vector and square them, and then you add up those squares, and then you take the square root of that. That's called the two norm. Okay. I bet you've seen that somewhere in geometry. In fact, I'll show you on the next slide. The two norm looks, well, in fact, I'll do it now, looks something like that. You see that little picture I have up there, right here? Right? So this depicts what the, that norm looks like if you have two components, because you can't, it's hard to draw three or more components in a, in a plane. So what this says is that you've got, ah, um, a component x1, a component x2, and then the distance from the origin to this point here is, is the 2 norm of that vector. This comes from Pythagoras' theorem, I think, if you remember that. Okay. So I, I assume you've kind of seen something like that measure of what the, the length of that particular side of a triangle is from Pythagorean's theorem um, in geometry, and that, that you can calculate that as the 2 norm. Okay. Here are the other norms. So, a, a norm is something I'm about to tell you has certain properties it has to adhere to, and as long as it adheres to the properties, you can define any norm you want. So the two norm, you might notice, we put a little two here, so I can, so I'm specific about what I mean. The one norm is shown in the first thing, okay? So that in that case, you just take the absolute value of each component of the vector and then add up the absolute values, okay? One thing you probably can appreciate is that. Um, this norm is always going to be positive, or it could be zero. 
Okay. So the reason we take absolute value here or square here is because we don't want negative components canceling out positive components and things like that. Okay. There's something called the infinity norm. Okay. So that says you take the absolute value of all the components, that's this one here, and then you look at which, which component has the greatest absolute value, and that's your measure of the, the um, size of the vector. It's called the infinity norm. Or more generally, for the, for the two norm or the two, ah, all these norms can be written like this. It's, it's probably not obvious for the, it should be obvious for the two norm and uh, maybe not for the other ones, but this is called the P norm. So P can be any number here. Usually an integer would only be of interest to us. And so we could define, for example, the two norm looks just like this with P equal two. You could define a three norm and a five norm or whatever you want, okay? The ones we're typically gonna be interested in um, the one norm, the two norm, and the infinity norm. That's why I called them out. So here's an example. Um, so here's a particular vector, has five components. And all I've done in the example is just show you how to compute the norms for each of those, um, for each, <coughs> how to compute each of the norms for this particular vector. So the one norm, just take the absolute value of all the values, then add it up. So 10 is the number you get. The, num the value of the norm that you get is a function of which norm you're computing. So not all norms give the same value for the same vector. If you want to take the two norm, add, uh, take the square of each component, add up the squares, take the square root, that ends up being the square root of 30. Is square root of 30, that's clearly less than 10, right? <laughs> I'm pretty good at math. Okay, so I figured that out. Um, I guess that would be somewhere between 5 and 6. So you can see the 2 norm ends up being a lot smaller than the, the 1 norm for this particular vector. The infinity norm says take the absolute value of each of these components, figure out which absolute value is biggest. Obviously, it's 4. So the infinity norm of that vector is 4. Okay? So if I tell you I want you to compute a vector for some reason, a, a norm of some vector, I have to tell you which, which norm I'm talking about. Like the, the one norm, the two norm, or the infinity norm. Okay. Now that, probably none of that should be too exciting or shocking. Um, the norms have to have certain properties associated with them to be a legitimate norm. So only norms that satisfy this property are actually called norms. So first of all, if you take the norm of a vector x, it, ca it cannot be negative. Right? So no, no legitimate norm can allow negative values for the norm, okay? Um, the norm is equal to zero if and only if the entire vector is equal to zero, okay? So in other words, the only way you can get that the norm is zero is e if every one of these components is zero. It's the zero vector, in other words, okay? If you have um, k times x and you take the norm of that product, that has to be equal to the absolute value of x, uh, k times the norm of x, okay? If that's not true, then the thing you're working with is not a norm, okay? And the other property is this so-called triangular inequality that all norms have to satisfy. So if you want to take the, <laughs> the uh, norm of two vectors x plus y, obviously of the same dimension, you want to take the norm of that. This, th because I did this in the, that's less than or equal to. I won't explain why I did it this way. Okay, that means less than or equal to. Uh, that has to be le less than or equal to the norm of x plus the norm of y. That's called the triangle inequality. It's usually the hardest thing to prove that actually is satisfied, but it's also required. So any norm has to satisfy those four properties. Okay? So if you take, for example, the two or Euclidean norm, you can see that there's no way this, so if you want to check these things, there's no way that can be negative. That's pretty clear, right? The only way that norm can be negative or zero is all, if all the x's are zero, that's that component there, right? Or that condition there. Having trouble speaking today. <coughs> all right, if we take, take k times x, so k times x means you multiply every component by k, so then you'd get k x1 quantity squared, <coughs> k times x2 quantity squared, so you could pull out a k squared and you could pull that out of the um, square root and then you'd see that you're in, pretty easily it satisfies that condition right there. This one's a little more difficult to see. I, I didn't want to prove it, so you can look in the text if you, if you don't believe it, okay? All right, so vector norms are very convenient, as you'll see later in this lecture and other things that we'll do, um, and they're used all throughout applied mathematics and engineering. So I don't know if you've seen them before, but um, you will see them again. All right, so if you can take the norm of a vector, why not take the norm of a matrix, okay? That may seem a little weird, but 
So we're talking at this point only about square matrices and we again would like to have some measure of what, it, what the size of a matrix means. Okay? And so the notation we'll use is just the same as a vector. So you have a matrix A, put the double bars around it like that, that means the norm of the matrix A. There'll be more than one type of norm. Okay? And so we'll have to be specific about what norm we're talking about if we're taking a norm. There's a result that again I won't prove because we don't prove things in this class. But this is true for any matrix A, okay? So in other words, y A times X, okay? A times X is a vector, right? A is a, a is a matrix, X is a vector. If you multiply A times X, you get a vector, okay? So we know what the norm of, so that's just taking the norm of a vector. In this case, the vector is called A times X, okay? There's a result that says this norm here of this vector is always bounded above, okay? by something that looks like this. In other words, there's a value C. You don't know what it is. It exists. Okay. If you multiply the norm of X, that quantity will be greater than the norm of A times X. Okay. You might say, who cares? <laughs> All right. It's useful for what I'm about to explain in the, in the, in the thing below. Okay. So this is just, there, there exists a, cons a constant C that satisfies this. Okay. So with this in mind, you can define the matrix norm like this. This is probably the easiest way and then I'll explain why this makes sense. So the idea is if you, we don't even know what the norm of a matrix is, but we know what the norm of a vector is. So I'm going to define the norm of this matrix in terms of norms of vectors, right? So I'm going to say the, the um, norm of the matrix A is the ratio of the norm of a, a times X, right? A times X again is a vector, so we already know what it means, take its norm, okay? So I'm going to take the norm of A times X in the numerator, and I'm going to scale that by the norm of X itself, okay? And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to try to find, make this quantity, what this notation means, if you're not familiar with this, it means I'm going to try to make this quantity as large as possible by choosing the appropriate X vector. Okay, so you see, I have, I can choose any x vector I want, and I'm going to try to find the one x vector, assuming it's unique, I'm not even sure it is, um, I'm going to try to find the one x vector that makes this ratio as large as possible. Okay, and that's why we scale by the norm of x, right, because otherwise you just make x arbitrarily large, and that would make a times x arbitrarily <laughs> large. So, the way to think about this is you take a vector x and you're looking for the matrix A that kind of amplifies x to the maximal extent given that you have to scale it by x to begin with. Okay? All right. So that's nice because, you know, it's typical divide and conquer strategy. You know what the norm of a vector is, so you just define the norm of a matrix as the ratio of two norms of two vectors. Okay? Now it ends up that you can limit your search, okay? Instead of searching over all possible x's that have all possible norms, you can limit your search to vectors x that have a norm of one. Okay, you get the same answer. Just makes it easier to find in principle, okay? So there's no loss in generality in assuming that the norm of the vector x that you're searching for is equal to one, then that will go away, right? Because the scaling of that is one and you just get this relationship here. They're equivalent to each other, okay? All right, well that sounds great, but you know what? I still haven't taught you how to found the, the norm of a matrix. <laughs> this is all machinery and definition. Okay? All right, so here's how you can find different norms. Okay, these are the norms we'll be interested in. So l let me talk maybe about the last one first. This is the Froben so-called Frobenius norm. Do you know who Frobenius was? Famous mathematician, not surprisingly. You would you be surprised if he was a hairdresser or something? Right? It's like, what was he doing defining norms of matrices? Like, it, it, was, a, it was a real anomaly, but anyway. Um, all right, so Here's what you do. You take, all this says is you take every component of the matrix, square it, and add them up. But let's make sure we understand this. So, right, this, the, these little A's with the subscripts are indices of the matrix A. The first index means the row, and the second index means the column. So first thing I'm going to do is over all elements in the first row, that's J equal 1, I'm going to take all elements in that row, square them, and add them up. Okay? That's... The first, so right, J is one, I'll sum up all the elements in that row and then I'll do it for the second row and the third row and the fourth row. So when you have this double sum, the first is a sum over the columns and the second one is the sum over the rows. So this just says for the first row, square all the components and add them up. Then add that to the same thing for the second row and the third row until you've run out of rows. Okay? So it just means take every element in the matrix, square it and add it up. 
Okay? And then when you're all done, take the square root of that. Okay, that's called the Frobenius norm. That is, dare I say, the, um, whoops, wrong way, the matrix analog of the Euclidean norm. Not sure why Euclid didn't think of this. Okay. He's probably lived a couple thousand years earlier was the problem. All right. So that's called the Frobenius norm. Okay. Now, you can also define a one norm and an infinity norm. So you'll see in parentheses I have, sorry, in parentheses I have what, it's the easier way to remember it. A one norm means the so-called column sum. So if we look at this index here, okay, so again, J represents a row, K represents the column. So what I'm doing here is I'm fixing K, let's say, right? I'm looking at a particular column called K, the first column, second column, whatever. And then I'm adding the absolute values of all elements in that column. In other words, I'm adding up all the rows in that column, the absolute values of those, and I'm getting a number. And in principle, I do that for every single column. Just add up all the elements in each column by absolute value. And then I find which column gives me the biggest sum, and that's my measure of the norm. Okay? So that's why they call it a column sum. Just sum up the absolute values of all the entries in each column, find which column gives you the biggest sum, and that's the norm. That's called the one norm. Well, if you can do it on rows, you can do it on columns, right? And that's called the infinity norm or the row sum norm. You're doing the exact same thing, except now you're summing over the rows instead of the columns. That's why you have J out here and you're summing over K, right? Here you fixed the column summed over rows. Here you're fixing the row and, um, sorry, fixing the column and summing over the rows, okay? So do the same thing. Take each row, add up the absolute value of all, all the elements in that row, find which row gives you the largest value, that's the infinity norm, okay? All right. So here's a, here's a couple of examples, um, which we're going to deal with these matrices later, or maybe we already have. I don't know we haven't. So there's a matrix A, okay? <coughs> and I'm just telling you that happens to be the inverse of that matrix, just, just for example right now. The, the point is not why that's the inverse. It's how to take the norm of these matrices, okay? So what I've done here is I've taken both the one and infinity norms for both of these matrices. It's not hard. It's a two, <laughs> two by two problem, okay? So if you want to do the column sum, which means the one norm on A, first of all, you add up the absolute values of this column. That's 1.999, okay? And then you add up the absolute values for the second column, which is, you know, 2.0001, and the second column wins, and that's where I got that number, okay? You can do the same thing for this inverse matrix. Add that row, the absolute values, the absolute values of that row, they give you the exact same number. It happens to be 10,000. So it doesn't matter which, which column you sum over. You can sum over the rows, so if you sum over this absolute value here, you'll get two. You also get two here, so they're both two, so that's the norm. And in this case, if you sum over this row and you sum over this row, the first row will give you a larger value than the second row, and it's that number right there. All right? So it's not, it's not hard, right? And of course, in Mat if you, once you do this in MATLAB, you just issue a command, right? You don't even, <laughs> you don't even have to worry about how it's done. But... Um, my, my philosophy on MATLAB and all tools like MATLAB is that if you don't have any idea what MATLAB does, you can't use it. Like just learn, if, like one, one way to teach the class is just say, how do you compute the norm in MATLAB? Right, and just issue this command. We'd get through a lot more material, but the problem is when you solve real problems, um, or when, even when you do the homework problems that you're starting to do, there'll be problems that occur. Like it doesn't work, <laughs> you know what I mean? And if you don't have any idea what, what it does, if it doesn't, when it doesn't work and when it is working, you can't use the tool, okay? So even though in principle we would try to avoid finding such things by hand because it's cumbersome and you might make an error, it's important to at least know how to do it. So when you use MATLAB, you know what you're doing. Okay, so not surprisingly, uh, matrix norm has to satisfy some um, properties that are kind of mimic what you see for a, a vector norm. First of all, the norm of a matrix has to be a positive number or zero, cannot be negative. Okay, it can equal zero, the norm of ma uh, uh, matrix A can equal zero only if the matrix A is a zero matrix, it means all the elements are zero. If you take a matrix A, multiply it by a constant K, a scalar, take the norm of that, it has to equal absolute value of K times the norm of A, just like before. And this also has to satisfy some version of the triangle inequality. If you have two matrices of the same dimension, A plus B, and I want to take the norm of those, 
then that has to be less than or equal to the norm of A plus the norm of B. Okay? Any norm that satisfies those properties is legitimate. Well, actually has to satisfy the properties below as well. <coughs> okay? So these are additional properties that we impose. Then we, so you understand how math works, right? You, d you, just, d you just define this as what you want a norm property of a norm to be. You might say, well, who came up with those? I don't know who came up with those. But the point is, only norms that have this property are useful, you see. So you, we define norm has to have these properties, and pretty much we've characterized the norms that make any sense that actually do. Okay. Matrix norm has to have these additional properties. So if you take A times X, right, so a matrix times a vector of appropriate dimension, that has to be less than or equal to the norm of A times the norm of X. Okay. So this is an upper bound. If you have a matrix A times B, similar thing. An upper bound is the norm of A times the norm of B. And then if you have A to the N power, that has to have an upper bound of the norm of A to the N power. So these are just additional properties that a norm would satisfy. All the things we talked about already do. We don't prove it. Okay? All right. So um, all this is just machinery. It's just intended so that when we get to the point where we need to use a norm, you know, you know what a norm is. Okay? All right, so now we start um, talking about what we mean by ill conditioning. So we're talking about this problem, right? And we learned last time that if you have this problem, you can find the solution like this, right? If I give you a system of equations, square, meaning A is an N by N matrix, AX equals B, then this is the solution assuming A is invertible, right? And I t we learn when A is invertible. Terminant of A cannot be zero. All the columns have to be linearly independent, as do the rows, so on and so forth. Okay? So you can compute the solution like this. Okay? How do you find the inverse matrix? Well, we I taught you one way. If it's a two by two, I gave you a formula for explicit calculation. Otherwise, you have to do the Gauss-Jordan elimination to find the matrix A, right? Or to find the inverse. So I'm not really talking at this point about um, you know, how to find the matrix A. I want to talk about a particular problem um, that is formulated like this. So let's say you have this system of equations. This is pretty common that you know the matrix A, okay? Like, for example, A might, we'll see a problem like this, I think, uh, tomorrow, actually, in the MATLAB session. But A might be like a matrix of stoichiometric coefficients or something like this. These things are known. There's no uncertainty about it, you understand? There's a reaction, you know the stoichiometry, okay? You want to compute X, which might be a set of rates, for example, as we'll see tomorrow. And then B is a set of measured rates, okay? So the way to think about this is there's no uncertainty with A. That's why I say it's a perfectly known matrix. There's no possible error in it, let's say. But there could be easily errors in the vector B, right? Because B comes from measurements. And anytime you have measurements, you should learn there's possibility for error. Could be random error, could be systematic error. Um, you understand the difference, right? Random error just means subject to random variation. Systematic means your sensor is faulty or something like this. Okay? So this is, this is the problem we want to consider. So I give you the matrix A and tell you there's no uncertainty associated with that. I give you the vector B with the idea there might be some error in the vector B, which I'll explain in a minute. And I want you to compute the solution um, X. Well, you just maybe you just immediately say that. There it is. I don't care what B looks like and I don't care what A looks like either, as long as it's invertible. That's the solution, okay? Well, that works well as long as the problem is so-called well-conditioned, okay? So, so you s when you see things in quotes, that means it's, I'm, not, I'm trying to be vague, very vague intentionally, okay? So I'm saying if the problem is well-conditioned, then if I give there's small changes in the vector B, that will induce small changes in the solution X. That's what you want, right? Because you wouldn't want small errors generating a lar large error in the solution, right? If that, if that happens, the problem is said to be ill-conditioned, meaning a small error in this vector B will induce a big change potentially in the solution X. That's a problem. Because if you have a problem like this and you cannot guarantee a perfect measurement, then you can't really have any confidence in the solution. Right? So this is a bit of a problem. So really today what we're talking about is how to characterize um, well, first of all, I'll introduce an example or a couple examples of ill-conditioned problems which have to do with the A matrix there.
and then talk about what the implications of those kind of errors are and also develop a quantitative measure of what, I, what we mean by this because this is not very quantitative. <laughs> That's why everything's in quotes. Okay? So you'll find that um, if a matrix, and I, I mentioned this I think briefly last time, if a, if a, if a matrix is ill-conditioned, it's characterized by having nearly linearly dependent equations. So not exactly, you understand, if I give you a problem like this, I hope I didn't screw that up. <laughs> Those are completely linearly dependent, right? There, there, there's no question that those equations are the same, okay? But let's say, for example, well, they're not exactly the same, but they're, they're awfully close, right? So this is what I mean by they're almost linearly dependent, right? If I multiply this, thing by minus one half and subtract it from this, I don't get zero, but I get something pretty darn close, okay? So they're almost linearly dependent. Um, so that'll be character, so if you have nearly linearly uh, dependent columns, then you'll find the rows and columns of your matrix are linearly dependent. The matrix is almost singular, not quite, but almost singular, okay? And the result of this means if you find a, if you find a solution like this, you can solve problems like this, but you have to be very careful about what the solution means and whether you can trust the solution. I'm about to show you that. Okay. All right. Um, at the near the end, um, I'm going to show you, actually, at the very end of the lecture, that if a system is large, it's very likely to be ill-conditioned. So it, this is a pretty um, okay <laughs> fictitious problem here that I've made up. Right. This is not likely to occur in the real world, um, but if you have a problem that's really big, I mean like a hundred equations and a hundred unknowns, it's very likely you'll have equations that are almost linearly dependent, right? Because that means can I multiply 99 of the equations and almost come up with a hundredth equation? That probability increases as the system gets large, okay? Um, and so I'll show you that at the end. And I'm going to introduce this thing called the condition number, which is a way you can characterize the um, ill conditioning or not so much ill conditioning of a matrix. It involves the norms, involves the norms of the matrix A. And it's inverse actually. Okay, so here's an example. Um, I don't, I'll work through the details here, but let's say you have this problem, okay? So here's your A matrix. You assume this is perfectly known. This is just to prove a point, all right? So here's your A matrix, it's perfectly known. And you can see it's almost singular. I hope you can see that, right? Because the first row looks a lot like the second row. I mean, if this was one and this was minus one, they'd be the same. So they're not, it's not quite singular, but it's very close. And then on the right-hand side, I'm assuming a vector that looks like this. This epsilon represents an error. If there's no error, epsilon is zero. If there's some error, then epsilon's not zero, okay? It represents a measurement error, something like this, okay? So the idea is to go through this problem analytically and show you what the effect of this epsilon is. And I'm going to show you a small change in epsilon gives you a huge change in the, in the x, which is bad. Okay? To prove this, I'm going to go do um, Gauss-Jordan elimination to find the inverse. Okay? So you might recall from last time, we do the Gauss-Jordan elimination like this. You, fo you form this augmented matrix. So there's the A matrix right there. Then you augment that, in this case, with a 2 by 2 identity matrix. And then you proceed to want to convert that thing to the identity matrix, and then whatever's over here will be the inverse. Okay? So I'm going to proceed to do that. And as you'll soon see, small numbers over here are going to end up giving you big numbers over here for the inverse. Okay? All right. So it, the, the, because the numbers are so close, the math is a little bit hard to follow, I think. Um, but in principle, it's the same thing we always did. We want to multiply this row times a number that when we subtract it from this row, we get a zero right there, okay? Um, obviously, the number you want to multiply this row by is one divided by 0.9999, okay? So in other words, if I take this row here and multiply it by one over that number and subtract it from row, this, that'll make that thing zero. That's what we do, okay? 
Okay, nothing will happen to the first, um, and that number happens to be this number that we're multiplying by, okay, or close. Um, so we multiply that, this row times that number, that'll make that zero. The number that we get here will end up being a really small number, and this is where the problem starts, okay? So it ends up being that number there. And actually the two is, this little two here is critical, as I found last night, okay? And then over here you end up getting this number, and then here you get nothing, okay? So all I did, again, one divided by that number, subtract it from this equation, you get this equation here. It makes that zero, you get a number here, now introduced, but the key thing is now you got this really small number right there, okay? But anyway, we'll just proceed, it's not zero, so we'll just keep going, all right? So what we wanna do now, obviously, is we're gonna take this equation, multiply it by some number that makes that thing equal to zero, right? right? because we want to get the inverse. Okay, well, actually, I forgot to, <coughs> forgot to, all right. Now that we're here, the first thing we're gonna do, sorry, is we're gonna make, right, the diagonal components equal to one. Once you've got this triangular matrix, the next thing, Gauss-Jordan elimination, is make the diagonal elements one. So I'm gonna divide every element of the first row by that number, and I'm gonna divide every element of the second row by that number. So that number becomes one, and that number becomes one. And if you do that, you end up getting this. Okay, so first row looks okay, but second row, because that number I divided by was so small, these numbers now are really big. Okay, all right. So, still looks okay, right? So you're getting nervous because it looks weird, but um, keep going. So now that we have this matrix here, I'm going to take this row, <coughs> multiply it by a constant, that'll make that row equal to zero, or that element equal to zero, right? So I should take the second row, multiply it by this number here, and add it, multiply it times 1.0002 positive, and then add it to the first row, and that'll make that element zero, okay? And then you get, this is the result of the rest of the calculation. It's, it's, you could go check it if you want. It's, <laughs> it's tedious. I screwed it up a couple of times. All right. So there you go, magic. There's your, you might say this is no problem, I'm done. There's my identity matrix, so that's my inverse matrix, right? It looks a little weird, it looks awfully, the elements look awfully big, but whatever. So now we're gonna implement this right here, right? And compute the solution, we got the inverse now. So the inverse equals that matrix we just calculated, the inverse matrix times the B, right? The B is one plus one plus epsilon, epsilon is that air. And if you multiply that stuff out, you get this, this right here, okay? All right, well, at this point, it doesn't take, I was gonna say a uh, rocket scientist, but I think from now on I'm gonna use civil engineer because I don't <laughs> really consider them at, at the same level as us. Um, <laughs> is anyone here, civil, you're a civil engineer? No. <laughs> okay. Plus the .5, plus the 5,000 .5. Um, well, look at this, so for example, if you multiply this, right, you get minus 5,000 times one, you get this number times one plus epsilon, so yeah, you'll get the 0.5 left over, yeah. So you can see the problem is you've got, you've, you've got what actually ends up being the correct solution, which is one half and minus one half, but then you have these huge numbers multiplying epsilon, so it's not gonna take a very big epsilon to screw the solution up, um, and that's what I show here, so if you, if you, you can see, this is an analytical solution, so you can see if epsilon is equal to zero here, the solution is one half and minus one half. That's the true solution with no error. 